podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Many thanks for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk in this school. Uh, so we'll be giving three lectures, and I think uh, I will divide the topics uh, into these three parts. Uh, the first lecture will be about sheaves and cohomology. The uh, second lecture will be about uh, varieties and uh, bundles. And the third lecture, if there will be a any time at all left by the previous two topics, will be about modular spaces, uh, by which I mean uh, modular spaces of bundles, of stable or semi-stable bundles. Uh, let's say, modular spaces of bundles. Uh, let me also uh, suggest some references from the beginning. There are some standard. Uh, well, first I will say something uh, more general, something general. Um, one can do uh, algebraic geometry basically using any field uh, as a field of coefficients. In particular, should, should one define what algebraic geometry is? Of course, uh, it's, it's not easy, but one could say it is the study of the spaces of solutions to algebraic equations. And you can do this on any, on any uh, field, so with taking coefficients in any field. Uh, on the other hand, I believe that uh, what we are uh, more interested, most interested in is uh, the case of the complex numbers. Uh, and that makes an introduction to the algebraic geometry easier because we can, at least uh, at the beginning, we can uh, have, uh, I mean, we, we can enter algebraic ge geometry coming from uh, complex differential geometry, uh, which is perhaps more familiar. From this viewpoint, the book uh, which basically follows uh, this approach is the standard book by Griffiths and Harris. which is called uh, Principles of Algebraic Geometry. Uh, while a book which is really deep into the uh, true uh, algebraic uh, setting is Hartshorn. The title is Algebraic Geometry. And very modestly, I can also suggest my own notes uh, since they of course, I will give uh, my lectures uh, according to my personal viewpoint, and this is reflected in, uh, in, in my notes. So the notes may be found, uh, these notes may be found from this. Uh, yep, it, it's already there. Okay, so I will save the two seconds in order to, to write this. It's, it's available from the school webpage. Uh, Okay, so uh, perhaps we may start. Ah, no, concerning, uh, by the way, I didn't give these two references. Concerning the last part, the modular spaces, uh, one good reference uh, for the differential geometric uh, uh, approach is a book by Kobayashi, which is called Differential Geometry of Complex Vector Bundles. And uh, a book by Ulbricht and Lenn, which is called, I believe, again, this is much more algebraic, uh, and uh, it's possibly something like modular spaces uh, of sheaves uh, on surfaces. Okay. So perhaps we start. And uh, well, actually, I sent a program for these three lectures, and the program uh, contains really a lot, an awful lot of stuff. So I don't really know what I shall, what I shall be really able to cover. I do my best. Uh, so we shall need uh, all through these lectures. We shall need some homological algebra. So I will start with a 
I could call it a micro pill of uh, homological algebra. So we need to talk about uh, exact sequences, uh, homology, cohomology, so we need some uh, basic terminology and some uh, very basic tools. So the idea is that, uh, well, what we need is to talk about the modules of uh, rings, so we shall consider what we need is a commutative ring uh, with unit. At least at the beginning, there is no harm in thinking we are working with z, the integers, uh, or with the complex numbers. Uh, and we shall consider modules over, over this fixed ring. And then we may have a first definition. We say that a pair MD is a differential module. So a differential module uh, um, is the basic object you need in order to do homology or cohomology. So the idea is that M is a module over R, and we have a map of M as a, as a, a module over R. So we call this map M with a property that this map squares to zero. And this map is usually called the differential or the differential module. Since the map squares to zero, <coughs> its image is contained uh, in its kernel and therefore we may take a quotient. And this is, well, at this point, to actually to say homology or cohomology makes no difference. Uh, let me call it cohomology. And we may denote it like this. Uh, we shall need to consider a situation where we have uh, maps between differential modules. And then if we have two, dif two differential modules, say MD, therefore, we have a map uh, D from M to M and N D prime. The very natural notion of homomorphism between these two objects is, to have, is that we have a morphism between the modules and this commutes uh, with the differentials. So this is no the notion of homomorphism of differential modules and it's uh, very easy to check, uh, I will not do this, that this induces a morphism between the cohomology groups. Uh, well, the objects that are in the kernel are usually called closed objects. The objects that are uh, in the image of, of the differential are called exact objects. And then it's very easy to check that uh, if f has this property, then it sends closed objects to closed objects and exact objects to exact objects. As a result, it defines a map uh, between the cohomology groups. It's uh, very easy to check. This map, usually called h of f. <coughs> uh, Well, of course, it would be very nice to give plenty of examples. Uh, we don't have that much time for doing that. Uh, let me just mention that, for instance, uh, it's very easy co to build up examples by, if you already know this theory, by considering that the RAM cohomology of a manifold. And then if you have uh, a map from a manifold to another, it's easy to construct uh, a map between the DRAM cohomologies using this stuff. The map goes the, the opposite than the, than the map between the, the differentiable manifolds and exactly fits this, uh, this structure. Okay, so this is the first notion, differential module, its cohomology, etc. And we shall also need uh, the notion of an exact sequence of R modules. So suppose we have uh, two maps uh, 
between, uh, so M prime, M, M double prime are R modules, and we have maps uh, in this way. Uh, and then we say that this is exact uh, if three conditions are satisfied. The first map is injective. The second map P is surjective. And the third condition is that the image of I coincides with the kernel of P as a submodules of M. And this is usually understood by writing zeros on the two sides because then injectivity of I means that its kernel is the image of zero, and surjectivity of P means that its co-kernel is, uh, is, is zero. Anyway, this is just notation. Mm, the meaning uh, of uh, a sequence to be exact is these three conditions. An example, <coughs> an interesting example, which will generate then a very interesting uh, and useful example when we shall talk about sheaves uh, is the following. You may inject uh, the, real, the integer numbers into the complex numbers. And you can compute the exponential uh, of a complex numbers. In particular, it's convenient uh, to include here a factor of 2 pi i, and then this maps uh, to the non-zero complex numbers. Uh, There's non-zero complex number, so uh, in this case the ring uh, is, uh, is a z. And um, uh, by the way, to be a z module is the same thing as being in a billion group. The two notions are exactly the same. And C star, it's definitely an abelian group uh, uh, with its multiplicative structure. And, the, and the, this X is a morphism of abelian groups uh, if in C you consider, as we very, very well know, in C you consider the additive structure and C star you consider the multiplicative structure. Then usually one puts a zero here and then here depends how precise you want to be. Perhaps one should put one, which is the the, the, the uh, neutral el element in this group. Or you can write zero, whatever. So uh, simple instructive exercise, check that this is an exact <coughs> sequence. <coughs> um, now, uh, we put the two notions together, and an interesting situation arises when you have an exact sequence of differential modules. So this means that you have an exact sequence of modules, but in addition to this, uh, every module as a differential, making it into a differential module. So you have a, a differential here, one in the middle and one on the right, making this diagram commutative. Okay? So not only we have an exact sequence of modules, but uh, we also have differentials. And the differentials are compatible with the morphisms uh, uh, in the exact sequence. So we have this situation where the two rows are exact uh, and all squares in this diagram commute. And here, a very interesting feature arises, which is a very useful, uh, also computational tool um, in homological algebra, which is the following. So uh, let's call I and P as before the two morphisms. So uh, I will understand the differential in this notation. Uh, so as we 
So we have a morphism going to the cohomology of M. From here, we have a morphism H of P going to the cohomology uh, of M double prime. Now what happens is that using basically this diagram, you can build a further morphism. So you may complete this to a triangle. There's a morphism here, which I will call partial, which uh, uh, not only makes this diagram commutative, uh, but it also makes it exact. So this means that in this uh, loop, so to say, the kernel of every arrow is equal to the image of the previous arrow. So this is what is called an exact triangle. And it's a uh, not completely, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very easy uh, check to, I mean, it's very easy to construct this, but it requires some lengthy checks. Uh, the idea is that you simply use this. Uh, um, diagram. Uh, so uh, you, you start from an element in the cohomology of M double prime. So this, this psi is an element in a quotient, so you can represent it with some element in the module M double prime. And then what you do is you take this element you take uh, an inverse image here because P is surjective. You push it down. You realize that it lies in the kernel. And then it comes from uh, M prime. And then you take its cohomology. It's simply like this. So the idea is that you, you do this. But then you have to make checks. Uh, for instance, uh, you need to check that it the cohomology class, uh, class you get here does not depend, depend on the choice of the counter image here, for instance. And um, a few more checks. But you can do that. Now, you might uh, uh, say that all this looks unfamiliar. Uh, actually, uh, what happens is that usually one sees all this in a, a situation where you have an additional structure. Namely, you have what is called a grading. So now we throw, throw in a, a grading. So this means that, for instance, when we consider a differential module, we assume that actually M is a graded module. For instance, graded over the integers, namely, it is direct sum of summons <coughs> uh, say labeled uh, by the integers. And you also assume that the differential is of degree one. In this moment, we are choosing homology as opposed to homology. Because if we were doing homology, the degree would be minus one. Okay, so D is again a morphism which squares to zero, but additionally it is of degree one. It increases the degree by one. As a result, also the homology groups, the homology group is graded. So it is a sum. a direct sum of homology groups, each given by a choice uh, of the integer. Now, um, Uh, very little changes here. Uh, in particular, if we consider this situation, I mean exact sequence uh, uh, of differential modules, it's uh, very easy to check that uh, 
the two morphisms, but that uh, in the two cohomology morphisms that we associate with I and P uh, have this uh, R of uh, degree zero. But uh, the morphism delta, let's give it its name, it's called the connecting morphism, is of degree plus one. So this means that if you start from Hn of m double prime, you get to Hn plus one of m prime. And this is very easy to understand because in our definition, there is one point where we apply D here. You remember that the idea was to go this way. P and I have degree zero, so the degree doesn't change, but when we apply D, you increase the degree by one. So for this reason, the connecting morphism is of degree one. It behaves like this. The result is that the triangle in some sense opens. opens. You may write it in, as a linear object. And in particular, very often, the grading uh, is uh, over the natural numbers, which means that we can make, very often, we can make the assumption that the um, summands uh, of, of negative degree uh, of the complex uh, uh, are zero. I said complex because uh, an object like this uh, it's usually called a complex. Of R modules. So if this is the case, uh, we can, uh, if we want to write uh, uh, now the triangle. Uh, the no, um, taking, um, remembering the degrees, we may start from H0 of M prime. There is nothing before this. So before this we have zero, and then we know we have a map to H0 of M, we know we have a map to H0 of M double prime, and then we have uh, the first connective morphism going to H1 of M prime. And then again, we have H1 of M and H1 of M double prime. These maps are, of course, H of I and H of P. And then here again, we have a connecting morphism going uh, to H2 of M prime, etc. Okay, and then the, this long exact sequence, uh, this is called the uh, I mean, an exact sequence, I call this an exact sequence altogether, but if you want to be more precise, an exact sequence with three terms is called a short exact sequence. Uh, you may very well have uh, exact sequences with more terms, always with this condition that uh, the kernel of an arrow equals the image uh, of the previous arrow. And uh, in particular, we see that uh, uh, when we have uh, uh, we have uh, an exact sequence, uh, I, we could say in this case of complexes, there is an induced long exact sequence in cohomology. This may be infinite, also on this side, by the way, just uh, I chose to see the, the case of uh, natural numbers just uh, because it's what most uh, often happens. Uh, it can also terminate, that depends on the on the situation you are considering. Yes, please. Um, what again was the reason why you consider cohomology as a covariant process? So the, the, the arrows have to change in cohomology. If I at some point I decided to consider cohomology. Uh, uh, had I decided to tell you about homology, this differential would have uh, uh, degree minus one, so going to m n minus one, and this uh, um, the arrows would be the, the other way, so decreasing the, the, the degree 
So the connecting morphism would decrease the degree by one. And then it depends. You may have a homology complex or a homology complex. This is an input de datum now. No, 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 no. There's nothing to change here. We are not applying any functor. Uh, I understand what you have in mind. And this is, uh, or perhaps I will spend, uh, this is a kind of an example. So, provided you know something about differential forms. So, let me say this is an example. Uh, you have a manifold, X, differentiable manifold. Okay, and then you consider the differential forms uh, with a Cartan differential. Okay, sorry. So this is a complex, uh, the Durham complex of X, uh, because D squares to zero, and you have a cohomology. So the cohomology has some. Uh, name, uh, we, we may denote it like this, where k goes from zero to the dimension of x. What you are referring is the following, I guess, that if you have uh, a morphism between two differentiable manifolds, then you have an induced morphism between the complexes, which goes the opposite way. And this is an example of a morphism, uh, since this commutes with D. It's an example of, uh, uh, of a morphism uh, of complexes. In this sense, the Ram cohomology as a functor from the category of uh, differentiable manifold to the category of complexes is a contravariant functor. But I was not talking about this. I, mean, I, I, I already had a complex. You see that what happens here is that already the map between the complexes go the other way. So it's another, it's a mm, more articulated situation with more stuff in it. <coughs> okay. Okay, not bad. Um, So this is the end of the pill. Yeah, but this needs water. I prefer this. I'm sorry. It works reasonably well. Okay. So next. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, so to say, the end of the first part of this lecture. Now we go to sheaves. This is the second topic of this lecture. Actually, we start with pre-sheaves. Uh, let me say that one can consider pre-sheaves of more or less any kind of algebraic structure. So we may consider sheaf of abelian groups, sheaf of rings, Sheaf of algebras, sheaves, sheaves of whatever. Uh, let's fix our attention to sheaves of abelian groups. Uh, okay, which uh, let me recall, uh, it also means Z modules. Okay, a Z module is exactly the same as an abelian group. So the idea is that we start from a topological space. Uh, well, there's a more uh, rigorous way to say what a pre-sheaf is. So what am I going to say is a little bit hard to say. Uh, it's a little bit rough, but anyway, it gives the idea. Otherwise, uh, you can give a more refined definition saying that a pre-sheaf is a functor, but really it's not needed. So the idea is that, uh, and this is the weak point, uh, the sentence that I'm going to say, the weak point of the definition, a pre-sheaf is the assignment to, a, to an abelian group to any open set in the topological space. 
So I will denote by P a pre sheaf The idea is that whenever you have U, which is an open in X, to this you associate an abelian group that I will call P of U. Um, but uh, we want that uh, uh, this assignment satisfies some locality um, property. So in some sense, the assignment that we make on different open sets should be compatible. In particular, it should be compatible with the inclusion, inclusion of open sets. So in other terms, uh, whenever we have uh, an open set which sits inside another, Therefore, we have uh, the group uh, P of U and the group P of V. We want that there is a morphism between the two that we call, for the moment, rho UV. Which, in some sense, uh, I mean, it is called the restriction morphism. Uh, from the moment this, uh, at the moment, this is just uh, uh, a name. Okay, it's called restriction morphism. And then, of course, in the example that we are going to make in a moment, uh, this will be a true restriction morphism. Uh, but we want more compatibility conditions. In particular, we want uh, uh, the following. Suppose you have uh, three nested open sets. Of course, W is also a, a, an open in U. So, in order to go from uh, u to, uh, to, to w, there are two different ways. And you want these two ways to give the same result. Okay? So we have this additional property. The first property is that we want that the restriction morphism exists. The second property is that they satisfy this commutativity. And the third condition, which is needed in the case of pre sheaves is that uh, there is a, a very particular open subset, which is the empty set, and to this you want to associate the trivial abelian group. <coughs> okay, so this is a pre sheaf uh, Of course, uh, we have plenty of examples of pre sheaves uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the most natural that you have uh, when you consider uh, a topological space uh, is the pre sheaf of continuous functions. So to every open set in our topological space, uh, you associate uh, the uh, continuous function from that open set to the real numbers, for instance. Okay, so X uh, as a topological space knows about uh, continuous functions. And so you consider the continuous functions from that open set to R. And you can immediately understand uh, that uh, the two conditions, of course, uh, the restriction maps, uh, the restriction morphism will be exactly the restrictions of functions. If you have a function on U and V subset, we may restrict it. Uh, and of course, the restriction of functions satisfy this condition. Okay? So this is one example. You can even make much more um, trivial examples. For instance, you could do the following. To every non-empty sub, uh, open subset, uh, you associate uh, the same group. For instance, the real numbers. And uh, the restriction morphisms are always the, uh, the identity. This is a very trivial example, but still it has something in it. Some non-trivial thing in it. Um, uh, next step, now we say what a shift is. As the name says, 
three sheaf is uh, an intermediate notion. We want uh, to uh, improve, uh, to get to the notion of a sheaf. Uh, and indeed, a pre sheaf is a sheaf which satisfies two additional conditions, usually called the sheaf axioms. And the sheaf axioms are, the first is a, a, a locality axiom. You see, uh, the sheaf axioms, in some sense, just state that a sheaf is a pre-sheaf given by local data. So the specification of a sheaf must be um, a, a local specification, in the sense given in a precise way by the axioms, of course, that we are going to see. The first axiom says that, uh, um, so I should say, I should add something about the terminology. The elements uh, in P, uh, if we have a pre sheaf uh, the elements in the group we associate to, to an open set uh, are called sections. So the idea uh, is that a section is zero if it is zero locally which means the following. This is a little cumbersome to write. For every open set in X, every section uh, <coughs> of a sheaf that we call F, standard notation, of course it comes from French. Well, of course, I don't know why, because in other languages, sheaves start with F. But in particular, uh, sheaves were invented by Jean Leray, as far as I know. So we owe this French terminology to him. So for every section uh, in our sheaf to be uh, over U, and every open cover, VI, of uh, uh, u, if the restriction of s, let me denote it like this, to any vi is zero, then s is zero. So in order to check that a section is zero, it's enough to check it uh, on the open uh, covers, uh, on the elements of some open cover. So in this sense, it's enough to check it, to check this locally. So this is the first axiom. Again, you see that immediately we realize that uh, our pre sheaf of continuous functions satisfy this condition. Correct? Because if a function is zero <coughs> in an open cover of something is zero on that something. It's a trivial statement. Also the second pre sheaf uh, um, satisfy this condition. Since uh, the restriction of morphine at identity, if you get zero, it means that you have zero. So this, even the second the stupid uh, pre sheaf satisfy this locality axiom. Uh, so here, we started from U, we had an open cover, and realized that, uh, or we stated, assume that it's enough to, to check uh, the vanishing of the section um, on the open sets in the cover. The second axiom is the so-called uh, viewing axiom, which states that you may build up a sheaf or a section of a sheaf by gluing uh, local sections, uh, satisfying some conditions, of course. Of course, we don't. Uh, want to be able, don't pretend to be able to um, glue anything. So the idea is the following. For every U, uh, again an open subset, and any open cover VI uh, of U, let S i b sections over this v i. So on any 
of these open sets, we assume we have a section. But then we assume that on the possible overlaps, uh, these sections coincide. Such that uh, S restricted to SI, sorry, restricted to intersection VI intersected with VJ equals uh, this is an I SJ restricted to this, uh, provided of course uh, that uh, the intersection is not empty. Then the idea is that we have a section, global section over U, which restricts to the given SI. Yeah, yeah. At some point, uh, I introduced uh, a quicker notation. So this i, sorry, this i denoted, uh, for instance, like this. Then there is a section over U such that it restricts to the given S i's. So section may be glued provided they satisfy gluing condition. It may be a stupid, seems to be stupid, but uh, I invite you to check that the second principle we introduced does not satisfy this condition. While uh, the first does, again, it's a matter perhaps of triviality in the sense that this is the way in which very often we define, fu we define functions. We define on some open cover and we check that on the overlaps everything is okay. And then we assume that this is defined globally. Right? This is what we do in everyday life very often. So we are using the fact that co say continuous functions are a sheaf. But it's very easy, uh, as we did, to introduce an example uh, here, sorry, of a um, pre-sheaf which is not a sheaf. It only, this pre-sheaf only satisfies the first uh, Axiom. Note by, uh, 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 was forgetting to say that this section that we assume to exist uh, will be unique if the first axiom is satisfied. Okay, in part, uh, so if the two axioms are both satisfied, then in the second uh, we can forget about uniqueness because it's given by the first. It's uh, a simple exercise that should show you that this is indeed the case. So you see that, uh, in, of course, this is a slogan, but uh, these two axioms satisfy, um, um, justify the um, saying that uh, a sheaf is a prefish, blah, blah, a sheaf is a pre-sheaf given by local conditions. So um, we may very well think that uh, all uh, um, objects that we uh, use very often in our daily practice are sheaves. Uh, but sometimes they are not. Another example, which I leave you to your consideration, provided of course you know some differential geometry, <coughs> but I guess I can assume th that this is true. Again, suppose that we have uh, a um, differentiable manifold And then we fix a K and to every open set we associate the K forms. Okay, on every open set we, as we consider the differential K forms on it. Uh, I, as I uh, claim that this is a sheaf. Okay, this I claim, uh, you, I leave it to you to, uh, to show it. By the way, the fact that this is um, satisfied the sheaf axioms basically follows from the fact that you may use on a differentiable manifold local coordinates and then a differential form, it's at least locally given by a bunch of functions. 
it's infinity functions, but of course I'm assuming that we already know that it's infinity functions are a sheaf. Okay, so on X, uh, if you want, we have a first example. The infinity functions, the differentiable functions make up a sheaf. And I say that also the differential forms uh, uh, make up a sheaf. Now we may consider two different, uh, two uh, kinds of differential forms. The first uh, uh, is uh, the closed differential forms. So you consider uh, for every open set uh, the Cartan differential and you consider the kernel of this, okay? These are the closed forms. And I claim that this is a sheaf. This gives rise to a sheaf. Why? The idea is that uh, uh, well actually there is no problem uh, for the gluing axiom because after all closed forms are forms. Uh, but in particular the locality axiom is satisfied because uh, in order to check whether a form is, is closed is enough to do it locally. Being closed is a local matter. Okay, uh, uh, form is closed if it is uh, uh, in the neighborhood of every point, so to say. So this is the reason why this is a sheaf. On the other hand, we may consider the image. <laughs> so what is called the exact forms. So the image of D going from uh, <coughs> the k minus one forms uh, to the k forms. Uh, and I claim that this is not a sheaf. Actually, uh, as we know, if we know something about the rank homology, Poincaré lemma, uh, uh, et, et cetera, the fact of being exact is not a local uh, issue. Okay? Uh, and again, I leave this to your meditation. But uh, if you meditate enough, you should come to the conclusion that uh, the exact forms uh, don't make up a sheaf. Uh, there's a part of the story uh, which uh, I'm, I don't have time to to tell you, which says that if you have a pre-sheaf, uh, there is a canonical way of making a sheaf out of it. So there is a, a way of a sheafify, so to say a pre-sheaf. There is a canonical way. Uh, and uh, it's not surprising that uh, uh, if we apply this technique uh, to the sheaf of uh, uh, exact forms, we get the closed forms. By Poincaré lemma, we basically know that uh, 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 locally, uh, exact forms and closed forms are the same thing if we are on an open set uh, uh, with a nice shape. So it's not surprising that if we apply this technique, uh, uh, we get that. I mean, from uh, exact forms, we get closed forms. And uh, we could think of applying that technique also to our uh, constant uh, pre sheaf uh, And in that way, one can show that uh, we get something different, uh, but by construction is a sheaf. So we get what is called the local sheaf. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through these details. By the way, as an additional reference, uh, uh, of course, you can find this, uh, for instance, in my notes, but an additional started reference uh, is uh, the book by Godman, uh, for which I don't know if an English ver uh, translation exists. Uh, I my custom to use the French uh, original. And you can find very detailed discussions of all this stuff. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is the end of the second part. Now we know about sheaves. 
Okay. Uh, so the idea is to stop around uh, one, uh, twelve twenty. So we have some ten minutes for questions. Okay, we are quite in good shape. Uh, and the third part uh, of this lecture, in some sense, uh, uh, puts uh, the two previous parts together. And the idea is to introduce some homology theory uh, that we may associate uh, with the sheaf. And in particular, uh, we are going to consider check cohomology. So, uh, we have a topological space. Um, the idea is that we have a topological space and a sheaf on it. Well, actually, it could, f to start with, maybe a pre sheaf. <coughs> um, but uh, to start with, uh, to, to, to define the check homology, we need something more. We also need an open cover uh, of, the, of the topological space. So U, this, is, this uh, uh, pretends to be perhaps a gothic U or something like that. That's my notation for, for open covers. So this will be something like this. Uh, so we have an open cover which is uh, labeled by some uh, um, index set, and we assume this is to be ordered, totally ordered. Um, and then uh, to define a cohomology, we know we need to define uh, uh, a complex. Let me define the few terms. This complex will be labeled by the natural numbers. And let me define explicitly the first few terms. So the first, so we have this rather baroque uh, notation. An element here, which will be called the zero cochain, uh, is the specification of a section for every open set there. So an, e an element here, say alpha, will be a collection alpha i, where each alpha i is a section over ui. Okay, so we have uh, a section for a, on any open set. This will be a zero cochain. So if we want to be more formal, this group uh, is the direct product over all labels of the groups uh, P of UI. <coughs> okay? Which means exactly this. We have a collection like this. Now, the idea is that we do the same for every possible, I mean, for intersection of every possible order. So next step, we shall do the same for double intersections. So perhaps uh, I will introduce a notation. For the moment, I will denote by u i j the intersection of u i and i j, provided this is different from from the MP set, and c one u p will be the direct product over all pairs i and j, where to 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 avoid uh, over counting, I assume that i and j are always ordered, i is less than j, of p uh, uj. And uh, we go on. So now it's very, it's not difficult to, s to realize what I should write uh, if I want to consider p cochains, 
we shall have a direct product over all collections of, of, of over all ordered collections of p plus one indices of uh, the groups uh, corresponding to the given intersection. Now, for instance, we go back to one co-chains. We can write something very explicit again. A one co-chain is a, a collection of sections here. Okay? So on every double intersection, we have a section. Now it's easy, uh, well, at this point it's not difficult to, we, we need a differential now, right? We have just defined groups. These are abelian groups. We need a differential. Uh, namely, we need something which goes from uh, p cochains to p plus one cochains and squares to zero. Then for instance, it's very easy to define the differential here. We, I will call it delta this way. If we start f uh, from an object like this, uh, uh, now this needs to have uh, uh, a collection, uh, two indices, because it's going to be a one co-chain. Correct. So we need to specify something with two indices here. And the idea is that, uh, of course, uh, it should be defined, this uh, co-chain should be defined on every intersection. And so the idea is that we compute restrictions. So this will be alpha j restricted to the intersection minus alpha i restricted to the intersection. As you see, this makes a very good sense and produces exactly uh, what we need. This is a one co-chain. Um, uh, let me uh, be a little pedantic, but just to give some idea, let me uh, do um, uh, by hand also the next step, uh, and we check that we get um, the delta squares to zero in this case, and then we define it in general. So uh, the idea now, if we have uh, a one co-chain, like this, and we want to apply delta, that now this will have three indices. While beta is just two, but the idea is that you omit uh, the three indices uh, in succession with a sign. So this will be beta jk restricted to the triple intersection minus beta ik restricted to the triple intersection plus beta ij restricted to the triple intersection. Uh, perhaps I will go there. Now, what if compute uh, this? So uh, the idea is that uh, uh, so delta alpha is up there. Uh, so we need to write alpha j minus minus alpha k. And then we need to write minus alpha i plus alpha k. And then we need to write uh, plus alpha i minus alpha j. All these are restricted to the triple intersection. And you see that we get zero. OK. So this means that we are in business. And uh, we can write a general formula. If alpha is an element in C, P, 
uh, I mean, uh, if alpha is a peak or chain, then delta alpha will have p plus two indices and will be uh, the sum minus one to um, k going from zero to p plus two minus one to power k alpha where you omit the k index uh, here p plus one yeah two sorry one too much so this is the general formula you see it's exactly the same you omit in turn uh, an index uh, you have an alternated sign alternating sign and you restrict to the relevant uh, intersection and uh, exactly for the same reason it's, it's very easy to, to write it if you compute the, the square you always get zero because you, you write twice the same object but with a different sign here by making a relabeling so we are in business we have uh, a um, we have a co um, cohomology complex. So we can take cohomology. And we get these groups for every k. So for the moment, uh, these groups depend uh, on, uh, on a triple. The manifold, the sheaf, the pre-sheaf, and the open cover. It may, we might think that it's a little bit inconvenient to have the open cover. Really it is not, because this is what makes uh, uh, Czech cohomology very uh, computable. Because you can make uh, a computation using, um, using open covers. But perhaps uh, at least at, uh, at the level of definition, you would like to have something which is independent on the open cover. Then one has a rather tricky situation in which on one hand, uh, you dispose of the cover. How? There's a general procedure in homological algebra or <coughs> where you can um, consider a limit, uh, for instance, of these groups uh, when you take uh, uh, open cover th that are finer and finer. So if you have an open cover, you have a notion of refinement. It's another open cover whose open sets are subsets uh, of the open sets of the previous cover. So the open sets are smaller, so to say. So you have a notion of refinement. It's possible to show that when you have a refinement of an open cover, you have a map between the homology groups uh, and this is exactly an example of what I did uh, I mean morphism of different of complexes and uh, induced morphism homology and this allows one to take a limit uh, which is called an inductive limit but I will not go into the details uh, uh, of this but the idea is that out of this you may consider groups which will depend on X here to, uh, to avoid the confusions one put uh, uh, um, check stress uh, on the H. But now the price that we, that we pay is that there is no way of computing this. This is too uh, an abstract object. And then uh, what one does usually is to uh, consider a situation where actually there are, you consider open covers which exactly compute the limit. So there are open covers for which the cohomology coincides with the limit. <coughs> and then it's very good to consider such open covers. <coughs> uh, so this may be rather, all this definitely sounds very metaphysical, but uh, of course uh, there's a, a question of uh, lack of time. Uh, let me suggest an, a very easy exercise, but you know easy exercise very often are uh, important to understand what, what one is doing. So we, we consider S1. On S1, we consider the constant sheaf we defined, and uh, I propose you to consider this open cover. <coughs> so an open cover made by three 
intervals, mm -hmm. which have the very nice property that they overlap on uh, um, connected um, uh, connected uh, um, in intervals. I mean uh, subsets. Uh, the exercise is compute the cohomology of this open cover and uh, the exercise will show that what you get is the same as the Deram cohomology if you know the Deram cohomology and of course the result is by no means uh, um, uh, occasional I mean there's a, uh, of course there's a reason for this but anyway now uh, time is flying So let me spend the last 10 minutes uh, in discussing a situation uh, where uh, long exact sequences in Czech homology arise. Unfortunately, this requires a little dis discussion on the notion of exactness uh, that we use uh, for sequences of uh, sheaf morphisms. Uh, I'm cheating actually because uh, I never introduced the notion of sheaf morphism. Uh, so, or pre sheaf morphism. So, let's first introduce that. A pre sheaf morphism from P to Q, so P and Q are two pre sheaves on the same topological space. Uh, this is simply a collection of morphisms between the corresponding groups. Right? For every U, we have two groups, P, U, and Q, U, and so we, have to, we want to have a morphism. Uh, between the two. Of course, uh, we don't want this to be just uh, independent of the pre shift structure. And then we want this to be compatible with restriction, restrictions. So if we consider a subset, we shall have another morphism, FV. If vertically, we have the two restriction morphisms. I use the same letters, but actually they are the extension morphisms of different pre sheaves, and you want these to commute, right? Otherwise, we, we are in serious trouble. So this is a notion of morphism of pre sheaves, and for sheaves you use the, the same notion. Now, the road is open to consider exact sequences of pre sheaves, because we are very clever and we say very simple. If we have two morphisms of pre sheaves, say I and P, we say that this is an exact sequence if it is so on every open subset. So for every open subset, we have a sequence of morphisms. And we ask this to be exact for every open set U. This is very good. It makes a very good definition, but uh, unluckily, uh, the exact sequences of pre sheaves are exceedingly rare. So it is too strong a requirement. And it's very easy, for instance, to make uh, um, an example. Suppose uh, uh, you remember this exact sequence. Out of this, uh, I mean, we can use this as a, a suggestion to get an exact sequence, uh, uh, I mean, whose uh, blocks uh, are um, sheaves. So we consider, for instance, suppose that X, uh, can I say X is a complex manifold? We know more or less what a complex manifold is, right?
Anyway, I'll give this definition uh, in the next lecture. So X is a complex manifold. Z is the constant shift uh, on it. And now instead of, uh, of C, I consider the shift of holomorphic functions. Yes, please. natural transformation. Um, I, you are, are you using the term natural transformation in a categorical way? Uh, then, uh, exactly, uh, if we say that the pre-shift uh, is a functor, which, which it is, it's a functor from the category of open subset of topological space spaces of a, uh, from the beginning. So X is a topological space, uh, and you may consider the category of its open subset. The vortices are the inclusions. And then a pre-shift is a functor from, mm, is a contravariant functor from this category to the category of abelian groups. Yeah. Then the morphisms are the natural transformations. Yes. That's it. Yes. And, and this is exactly this. Yeah. Huh? No, no, no. I just said that I'm using it. It's uh, abuse of notation. Oh, yeah, 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 I should. Uh, it was a, I consider this to be a little too, too baroque to use, but <laughs> it's, uh, no, no, of course, they are different morphisms. So here we consider uh, the holomorphic functions. And then we consider the holomorphic functions uh, which are never zero. Holomorphic functions without zeros. This is the just inclusion. Uh, a section uh, uh, of this constant shift is just, uh, uh, is just a, um, an integer number, at least on a connected uh, set. Uh, in particular, a constant integer number is a holomorphic function, of course. So we have inclusion. And here is the same exponential as before. Now, this is not exact in the sense of pre-shifts. Eh? Because, uh, for instance, if you take this example where x is just the complex numbers, so the base manifold is the complex numbers, and uh, we consider the open subset that we obtain by removing the zero, and we consider the section z, z meaning the standard coordinate on c, this is not in the image of the exponential because of the usual problem with the logarithm, which is multi-valued. So z is not in the image. The problem is that our open set uh, includes zero. But anyway, this means that this map is not subjective for all open subsets. It becomes immediately subjective if we remove, if we consider a contractible uh, open set, basically. So if uh, u is contractible, in this case, I mean, uh, then uh, x from Ox of u to Ox star of u is a subjective. So we see that uh, uh, it's not true that this is an exact sequence of pre sheaves uh, But then what we do is to change the definition. Now, I'm a little bit uh, in lack of terminology, but the idea is that um, uh, we require, a, I mean, we give a new definition and we say that this is exact in the sense of sheaves uh, when the last arrow is locally surjective. So every point has a neighborhood over which the arrow is surjective. This is not exactly the top in terms of elegance, but uh, uh, it makes uh, the, the job. Okay, in order to, to, to say this in a um, nice way, I should introduce the notion of a stock of a sheaf. Uh, and, but uh, I don't have time to do that. Anyway, the idea is that we require exactness only, exactness only locally. And when this is true, when the exactness holds locally, 
we say that uh, this uh, a, a sequence of sheaves is exact. And in particular, this becomes an exact sequence of sheaves. It's an example of an exact sequence of sheaves. Uh, now, what happens? We would like the following. Suppose we have an, uh, so we, one can prove the following theorem. If, I think I will stop uh, uh, and then uh, I'm almost at the end, but I'd like to have some time for questions. So we have time this afternoon to finish this. So suppose this uh, uh, is exact. Uh, as a pre sheaves. Then one can show that we have a long exact sequence in a check cohomology. Now, this is very long to write. No, pre sheaves. Otherwise, this is in general wrong because I'm not assuming anything on X. No, 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 no. I'm assuming that uh, as pre sheaves means for every uh, open set. This is a very strong condition. On every open set, the sequence is exact. Then we get this. Well, I w one should prove this, okay, but so here we have a connecting morphism. The fact is that from this we get uh, uh, an exact sequence uh, of uh, complexes, and from this we get this. But this is exactly the problem, that usually our sequences are exact only as a sheaves. So, uh, so uh, under this assumption, in general, this theorem is wrong. It's not true that we have a long exact sequence. Thank you. Yeah, right here. Uh, so the point is, uh, can we consider some situations uh, where uh, nevertheless this is true? So we assume that the sequence is exact in the sense of, pre of sheaves, uh, sorry, of sheaves, uh, and we have a nevertheless a long exact sequence of cohomology. Now it turns out that there are two situations. Uh, Luckily enough, one is what happens in differential geometry, and the other is what happens in algebraic geometry, in some sense. So for today, I don't have time to say more, but uh, one can say the following. If you have an exact sequence of sheaves uh, and we are on a topological space which is paracompact, I uh, will say what it is in a moment, then the same. So the paracompactness of the space comes uh, uh, to our rescue and allows us to write a long exact sequence uh, of cohomology anyway. Uh, para a space is paracompact when it is Hausdorff uh, and uh, every uh, open cover has a locally finite uh, refinement. So you can consider a cover such that you have a point uh, in the neighborhood and a, a set in this cover, then only a finite number of uh, other sets will intersect this. So you can consider open covers uh, in which the sets, uh, so to say, intersect only I mean, only finite, many of them intersect. Uh, you, you don't have infinite intersections. Uh, when this is true, then you can prove that starting from an exact sequence, for instance, like this, uh, you have an, uh, a long exact sequence cohomology. Unfortunately, this is not what we need in algebraic geometry because, uh, uh, as we shall see uh, to, um, this afternoon, uh, in algebraic cohomology, one doesn't use, uh, for instance, uh, on this, if on this uh, uh, space C, we think the usual, the analytic topology, so the topology that it has as R2 with the standard topology, 
then this is paracompact, we are in business. But this is not the topology that one uses in algebraic geometry. In algebraic geometry, one uses uh, another topology, which is called the Zariski topology, which doesn't satisfy this condition. But in that case, uh, it works anyway for other reasons. And I will give a hint to that this afternoon. Now I guess it's high time for me to stop. Uh, time for questions, I guess. They want the categorical definition of pre-sheaf. Yes. Because then, uh, in any case, as far as I know, the sheaf is a pre-sheaf which satisfies the uh, sheaf uh, axioms, the two axioms. Yeah, sure. So, the idea is that you go in. So we have a topological space, uh, and from this we consider a category, open X, uh, whose objects are the open subsets. Uh, and the morphisms are inclusions. Okay, I only consider inclusions. This is a well-behaved category. And then another category I consider is the category of abelian groups. The objects are the abelian groups, and the morphisms are morphisms of abelian groups. And then I claim that uh, a big shift uh, is a functor, a contravariant functor between these categories, with additional assumption that P of uh, uh, the open um, of, the, of the empty set is the trivial group. Uh, so this means, as we know, that to every object here we associate, uh, to every open subset we associate an abelian group, as we said. This is what uh, avoids one to use the, the terminology an assignment which, which is not, not so nice. And uh, to every morphism, which is an inclusion, associates a morphism and between the corresponding uh, abelian groups, uh, which goes in the reverse way, because the factor is contravariant. So if V is in U, which means that there is a morphism in this category, we want uh, to have uh, a morphism between the corresponding groups uh, the opposite way. Okay, so this is a contravariant factor. And uh, I mean, this is just, uh, for the moment, uh, it doesn't add anything to what we said, just a nicer way of, of saying what the pre-shift is. Uh, 